Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My name is Alice Lee Hagen. Waikiki is a world-renowned destination. It is a meeting place for visitors who come here to enjoy the beauty of Hawaii. But for a small group of visitors, and there have been many over the past 20 years, they are here at a meeting place, which is a hidden treasure that's tucked behind the beachfront resorts and hotels. This hidden treasure is a world-class education institution for security practitioners to learn to debate, discuss global security issues. But more importantly, this is also a meeting place where these security practitioners can meet their colleagues and counterparts from all over the world to exchange ideas and to learn new perspectives. Today, to talk about this remarkable institution with me is Lieutenant General Dan Leaf. He is the director of Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. He retired from the U.S. Air Force after 33 years of military service. So, Dan Leaf, it's so nice to have you here Thank you. on my great. interview, General Leaf. And of course, as a proud alumnus of uh, DKI APCS Transnational Security Course, um, I am looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. We're very proud that you're one of our alumni and that you're wearing your lanyard. <laughs> you knew I'd scold you if we didn't, but we are, are proud of you. I'm very proud of what we do at our little hidden treasure. Well, um, there is so much that you can share and looking at your website, um, 20 years seem to be a short time, but mm -hmm. the things that you have achieved through the center, I think um, we probably won't do it much justice mm -hmm. in one hour of interview, but we will try. Great. So before we start, maybe I can share a little bit uh, of the 20th uh, anniversary and the renaming ceremony video with the with the audience. That sounds so, great. So, uh, producer, if you don't mind rolling that uh, one and a half, one and a half minute video, please. The countries. Um, the leaders um, on behalf of the Asia Pacific Center we're setting the vision. And that vision has never wavered. Um, and that's been fascinating to watch over the 20 years as we've built from not having a facility or a name or funding to being the center that you see today when you walk in our front doors and you see this world-class faculty and the staff that are here and our thousands of alumni across the region. That's the evolution that all started with this vision that Center to Inouye had, that the startup team had um, when I came on board, and again, it was unwavering. And to have, if you had told me in 1995 that this is where we would be today, I couldn't have seen it myself. And that's why I just have so much admiration for those who did see it and did go forward with, all right, we don't have a name, we don't have a building, we're not even sure where the funding's coming from, but we know where we want to get. And, um, and of course, we're still in evolution, we're still a growing center, um, pursuing that same vision, pursuing that same path. Um, again, that hasn't wavered in 20 years, and I'm sure won't waver for the next 20, because it's such a solid, solid mission, and, and it's just a remarkable vision. So General Leaf, I remember seeing this 10-minute uh, video during the ceremony, which, by the way, is an amazing one. And thank you again for inviting me. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, the center has accomplished so much in the past 20 years. Do you care to share some of the accomplishments with us? Well, I, I'd say that the people have accomplished so much because it starts with people like Lenore Patton, who's mm -hmm. one of our original employees. Uh, and not just the people who are on our faculty, you know they're fabulous, but the staff that is, does extraordinary work to bring all the people there, and our nearly 10,000 alumni worldwide. And what they've done is changed the world, or at least their world, and we're an organization that's really focused on outcomes, as you saw, mm -hmm. and not just talking about it. We give skills and knowledge and perspective that I don't know that you can get anywhere else. But if they don't do something with that, then so what? Mm -hmm. So many countries have national security policies or plans that mm -hmm. were written with the help of APCSS. And I'll go to the most recent major okay. accomplishment, uh -huh. a r recent election in Myanmar, mm -hmm. a very safe and secure election. The election security plan was a fellows project from one of our course participants. 
took it back, implemented it, and it worked. So uh, we've graduated 10,000 people. Uh, we've forged relationships that have been meaningful. And uh, those endure and are going to continue to bring value. They're, there are many more that I could cite, but I don't want to talk too long. <laughs> That's amazing. 10,000 yeah. alumni in right. and, and just 20 years' time. Mm -hmm. Now, um, 20 years is really a short period of time. So what have you seen that has evolved over the years then? Well, we started uh, as an outgrowth from Senator uh, Inouye's visit to a similar center in Germany. Mm -hmm. He saw that that and the work they were doing after the fall of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and thought we could use one of those in, in Asia and so uh, we were established but there a couple of things have changed. Uh -huh. The model has never changed. Uh -huh. The embodiment of Aloha, mm -hmm. the respectful collaborative approach to executive education has been constant throughout and the, those folks who started the center mm -hmm. deserve great credit for brilliance at, at conception because they got it right. Mm -hmm. But we've grown our programs. We now have alumni from every country in Asia Pacific except North Korea. Mm -hmm. We've built this focus on outcomes where things are being done differently and better because of what we do and frankly where conflict is being averted in some cases. So the growth has been in the impact and it's a natural process but we pursue it very aggressively to keep growing and not be satisfied with the fact that it's already a great institution. I know you keep talking about alumni and outcome, and I'd like to save some of these questions later on. Um, but perhaps, first of all, um, talk about some of the programs. I know you run so mm -hmm. many programs over the years. If you could share um, an overview with the audience on the types of programs you offer here in Hawaii and right. internationally. And I'd ask the audience to remember that we do this very efficiently with about 120 people total on the uh, permanent staff. I so. know. I, it, it is just amazing, um, really. <laughs> as an alumnus who have attended a one-week program, your staff is perfect in running all but these programs. They're awesome. They are truly awesome. Uh, but we have six curricula for our in-resident courses. In other words, six different courses that we teach. Mm -hmm. uh, four of them are about a week long, like your transnational mm -hmm. security cooperation. Mm -hmm. Two of those short courses are U.S. oriented, so the population is about 80 percent U.S. and their orientations to the region and its issues. There's the transnational, our most senior course that mm -hmm. you went to, mm -hmm. and then um, uh, we have three courses, so three of them are a week long, I misspoke. Three courses that are five weeks or so in length, okay. and those courses are topically focused, one on humanitarian assistance and disaster response, mostly. Okay. It's called comprehensive crisis management. Mm -hmm another on uh, countering terrorism, comprehensive security responses to terrorism, and a third on security cooperation. Mm -hmm. So six curricula, we execute about 10 courses a year. We also do 10 workshops, those are all in Hawaii, mm -hmm. 10 workshops mm -hmm. a year. Two of those are in Hawaii usually, and uh, eight of them out in the region, and mm -hmm. we do workshops anywhere, and Lenore Patton and her team could put a workshop on on the moon if you got them to the moon, they're just amazing. Um, those are workshops, not conferences. Okay. We're not very much interested in merely talking about things. Ah, okay. Okay? If we're not doing something, it doesn't matter. There, there's places for talk, but we're a Department of Defense organization. Mm -hmm. We should be action-oriented. Mm -hmm. We should be doing things. Mm -hmm. So that's the approach we take. We also have smaller level dialogues mm -hmm. in our faculty travels to do research. Mm -hmm. And the alumni is our third courses workshop, alumni, three main efforts. But we have a pretty big visitor program, about 200 visits a year oh. to the center uh -huh. that bring 1,500 people beyond the courses, beyond the workshops, oh. and what do they to do? the center. They might be, you might be an ambassador, a United States ambassador is proceeding to post in um, name a country, okay. and they'll stop to get the Asia Pacific Center's perspective on the region and the country they're going to represent us in. They might be a senior foreign official um, earlier this year, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam visited President Obama in yes. the White House. Mm -hmm. I think that many in the State Department would agree that process began of getting that really land groundbreaking visit happened with the senior visit of another party official to the U.S., first one ever, that started at APCSS. And the dialogue that started there led to 
a, a unique engagement between a, a, our center and mm -hmm. officials in uh, Vietnam, and there you are. So the visits program is very wow. important. Uh -huh. We also have a big, uh, a fabulous intern program I'd be glad to tell you about. Oh, wow. Um, now, can I go back a little bit sure. to talk about the different workshops you do uh, internationally? How do these topics get selected, or how do you decide what topics to work on, on a workshop, in a workshop? It all starts with the priorities that we get from the Office of Secretary of Defense for Policy and from Pacific Command, mm -hmm. because I found it's career enhancing to do what you're told. So, okay, of course. So we start with the guidance, mm -hmm. and everything we do starts with the guidance mm -hmm. that we have. We're not off on our own. Mm -hmm. And then we take that and what we know our, our friends around the region, our partners, mm -hmm. are, are interested in, mm -hmm and areas that we have expertise and can affect some outcomes in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the faculty will start with the guidance, what they've learned from their experience and from our fellows, our participants, mm -hmm. and they'll bring up workshop proposals. In fact, I just reviewed next year's proposals and approved them. Oh, okay. and, then, and then we'll go execute them. The location depends on the topic and the partner, because some of these are just the US and another country, some are trilateral. Pardon me, some are multilateral. So um, uh, we executed in uh, 2014 workshops three weeks in a row in uh, Vanuatu, Singapore, and Naypyidaw, Burma. Think about that. There aren't three more diverse locations. They were all different topics, but the team was able to execute That's amazing. workshops. Your team really works magic to be able to do that and the programs here in Hawaii. But Sorry to interrupt, but I, I always have to say that's part of the education. Mm -hmm. You know, we have faculty and we have staff, mm -hmm. but the staff are more than that. I call them non-faculty educators. Mm -hmm. We're not perfect, but we're pretty darn good. And to imagine getting 112 people from 40 countries for five weeks, tickets, to everything that goes into it, a lot of miracles. We have to do that because if we don't provide an example of an effective, well-governed organization, we're going to lose credibility. And instead, we gain credibility. Many of our participants go home talking about the APCSS way and doing things our way. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the education. That's amazing. Now, let's talk about the programs you do, do here. I presume they probably are very different from the ones that were first offered when the center was established. They evolved mm -hmm. and expanded mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the number of offerings. The approach didn't, as I said, this, the, and I'll, I'll say again, I'm sure that we could do this nowhere but Hawaii. Aloha is so much of a competitive advantage for us to, for creating uh, productive, positive mm -hmm. dialogue, even amongst those who disagree. Mm -hmm. So that part hasn't changed. We used to have fewer courses, and they were generally longer. Ah, I see. So we had a course mm -hmm. that was up to three months. Wow. And the, what we found after the initial iterations, and when I say we, I'm talking about everybody else at the, mm -hmm. at the center, and I've only been there about four years, uh, but what was found was that uh, you can't get the right kind of people continuously for three months because they have real jobs. These are all security professionals. Mm -hmm. so they might be commanding a brigade. We had. A Colombian fellow in our last TSC was in charge of all the operations against the FARC guerrillas. But wow. he took a week off to come there. He can't take More than three that, weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't take a, a one-star general from name a country and bring him there for three months and, and sustain that. We were able to do it because of the draw of the new center, mm -hmm. so we've shortened the courses to five weeks in about one week. Wow. And then I think eventually we recognized the importance of countering terrorism, so that course evolved, and the humanitarian assistance disaster response focused mm -hmm. comprehensive mm -hmm. crisis management. So it's an evolution, but not, yeah. a, not a huge change. Well, there are still so many questions about these, uh, these courses and workshops, but I think I'd like to move on to talk about the fellows or the alumni. But I know we're also coming on a first break. Okay. So after the break, we'll talk more about your fellows then. I'll be here. You're watching FinTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My guest today is Lieutenant General Dan Lee, Director of Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. We'll be right back after the break. 
Aloha, my name is Justina Spiritu, and I'm the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and you can catch us every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. What do we talk about, Matt? So on Hawaii Farmers Series, we're going to be bringing on the farmers and also supporter of farmers, including restaurants, caterers, as well as government supporters and nonprofits to hear their background stories and understanding our local ag community just a little bit better. Yeah, essentially there's a lot more that goes into farming and the local food community beyond just producing the food. And we want to feature and get the background story on all these folks and see how we all work together as a community. So join us every Thursday. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My name is Alice Lee Hagen. If you're just joining us, my guest today is the director of Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, Lieutenant General Dan Leaf. Uh, General Leaf, so we talked about the programs and workshops at DKI APCSS. Um, and of course, this, these questions now would be some of my favorite ones about the fellows and your alumni. Um, I guess without them, you know, the program is just a program. Um, I guess first thing maybe I can ask you, what are some, um, maybe you can tell us some of these illustrious alumni that you have. I sure. mean, 10,000 of uh, them, I'm sorry we don't have time yeah, to talk about every single one of them. Um, they, what, the reason the alumni are so important is because we start with extraordinary fellows, mm -hmm. but we also work hard to create fellowship. We have what you might call social events that are thoughtfully placed uh, foundations of fellowship throughout the curriculum to build relationships mm -hmm. and make you know ties that, that last. Mm -hmm. um, but the people who come to our courses are extraordinary and our US participants in the more international courses I think get a little bit of humility. We're a proud, proud nation, we deserve to be a proud nation, but when they see the quality of the security professionals, military and civilian, from all around the region, it's humbling because they're just as impressive as anybody we've got, and that's that's a good thing. Uh, they're smart, they're engaged, and they're committed to making the world a better place. And w they go out and do that uh, after they leave the center. Many of them have progressed. Three heads of state, over 120 current or former ambassadors, too many four stars to shake a stick at. Not that I ever would have shaken a stick at a four star, but um, so they've succeeded. I don't think that's the real measure of merit. Uh, the real measure of merit is what they do uh, and accomplish. And an example is that election security plan for Myanmar mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, was successful and really a remarkable accomplishment out of a five week course. Mm -hmm. Our alumni in Nepal also assisted the government in their November 2013 election. Uh, uh, um, election security mm -hmm. and provided advice and that was very safe. Uh, the We had a participant in a workshop, not a course, and uh, his project in that course was to find a way to make peace with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. He wrote an operational plan to do that, took it back to the Philippines, briefed the president, it was implemented, and last year they signed a peace agreement effectively ending 40 years of conflict. These people do amazing things. We had a, a, a fellow from uh, Japan recently, mm -hmm. a young male fighter pilot, Colonel, mm -hmm. F-15 mm -hmm. guy like me. Mm -hmm. those, those are my roots. <laughs> and uh, because of our education on women, peace, and security, he got it in mind to advocate for acceptance of women in fighter cockpits in the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force. That's a cultural stretch. Mm -hmm. First time he briefed the chief of the Air Force, wasn't well received, but over time he continued to advocate for this, and about three weeks ago, that was approved. That's a fellows project. So I have a lot more. You know I do because these are amazing people mm -hmm. who, given the tools mm -hmm. that we give them, will can change the world. It is really amazing all these achievements achievements that you've uh, been able to accomplish through these programs, getting people together and giving them the opportunity to think of things uh, doing things differently in their mm -hmm. own country. Um, but maybe uh, if I can ask the producer to roll this uh, this video clip, I guess I would like to well, you've talked that to us a lot about the different outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, 
and the alumni that you have all over the world, but maybe we'll hear from one particular one who is here actually on island. Pacific Center. I went through the, uh, the Transnational Security Cooperation course in 2008, and um, an opportunity to, to be a part of that class and establish some of those relationships. Asia Pacific Center really seeks to um, ensure that that convergence will overcome any friction that might result uh, between two or multiple countries. Do you remember, Dr. can you tell us about Dr. Ka'ili Vaya? Well, I can because <laughs> I hired him to work at Pacific Command when I was oh. a deputy. Uh -huh. And I met him before that uh -huh. in the Air Force, and we worked together at Pacific okay. Command. Mm -hmm. And he was the guest speaker at my son-in-law's graduation from Air Force Test Pilot School. So, yes, I could go on. And on. He's a, a great guy, but the kind of senior leader, senior executive service, the J-8 uh, resources at the... Uh, Pacific Command, so extraordinary responsibility, and he came and participated in the same course you did. And so that's a U.S. example. Mm -hmm. We get one and two star and three star generals. We had a Minister of Defense in our last DSC, country's Minister of Defense, who took a week to come to Waikiki. So how do you um, invite these fellows to the programs? Do you uh, does the center invite them personally? What is the process? Well, we work very closely with mm -hmm. the embassies and the team are the teams in the U.S. embassies. Mm -hmm. We do everything through them, usually through a security cooperation officer or defense attaché, and we coordinate a lot before we do that. Mm -hmm. They convey the quotas, if you will, as we divvy up where we're going to try to attract people from oh. to the government, and the government chooses. Okay. In some cases, the governments don't want suggestions. In other cases, they're open to ideas if we've met somebody or have a certain you know, person or, or type of person that we want, and it can become a negotiation. But it's a very collaborative effort. So, so you, actu you were saying that there's quota and there's, uh, I guess, target country or mm -hmm. participants you, that you want. So is it different for dif uh, different courses? It's different for different courses mm -hmm. and different for different times. The terrorism course were directed by the, the U.S. government to be more global. So we had 14 African nations or Africans in the course last year. As a, so it's more global than the other ones okay. last iteration. Mm -hmm. um, but the rest, for example, we've got a, this comprehensive crisis management course starting February 12th, I think, of next year. Okay. And we will have 126 slots, fellows. And our, that'll be our largest long mm -hmm. course ever. And so we have certain things that we want to do. We want to make sure we represent the region. Mm -hmm. We also know that some countries might want to bring what we call a cohort, a group mm -hmm. who will come to address a problem or uh, an issue or opportunity in their fellows project as a group and work their way through oh, it. Okay. So for example, we invited more than normal from one country mm -hmm. last year for an advanced security cooperation course. Mm -hmm. And their fellows project was to write the, the country's national security uh, strategy. So they did that and then it took it back and implemented it. It's amazing. I'm just the, thinking of the complication in the logistics, it, arranging people from all these different parts of the world to come here. We have to recruit them. They have to go through vetting to make sure they're acceptable uh -huh. people. We've got to ensure they have visas, they have tickets, meet them at the, uh, they get to Hawaii, we meet them at the airport, get them in lodging, start every course on time, finish the course, and you know this, on time and meet course objectives day after day after day. That's that APCSS way because the fellows understand that it's, there is nothing simple about how easy the team makes it look. General Leaf, it's so nice to be hearing this because I can still remember what it was like yeah. from the day I got there to attend the reception for the TSC in June until I graduate. I mean, the operation is just so smooth. You've got a great team. It's a great team, and they I think they do truly understand that everybody is part of the mission. It's not just the faculty or the director, people who provide lodging. Everybody contributes to setting the example mm -hmm. for good governance. But I guess um, it's good also that you mentioned that there are some courses where you have perhaps a larger number of participants from the same country because uh, when I remembered from the, uh, from the June course that uh, there were 25 of us, two of us from the mm -hmm. U.S., but the rest of the 23, they were all from everywhere, different parts of, 
from, uh, from different parts of the world. Do you see that there's different dynamics if you say have um, a group that is very diverse, um, there's no you know, two people from the same country as opposed from uh, say a program mm -hmm. with um, maybe a larger group from the same country. Is, are there differences? There are differences mm -hmm. and they're not plus or minus. Okay. One's not better or worse. Your course is our senior course mm -hmm. and so we want to bring senior leaders yeah, from around the region who are go already interacting mm -hmm. with, probably or going to interact and so that you know one from every country works. In uh, our longer courses we, we often talk about how we bring people from countries that don't get along and I won't name them all but there are a lot of them mm. out there and bring them into this environment and they build relationships and overcome their differences at least for now and often they uh, make a difference. Yeah, but we also find you have just as much positive impact by bringing people from different agencies and organizations in the same country who may be just as disinclined mm -hmm. to cooperate because you know they have different wow. organizational priorities and jobs and missions yes, yes. but you get them in this environment mm -hmm. and and something happens and I'll tell you what happens if I may in 30 seconds we we do active polling where we solicit mm -hmm. the views you've seen it and mm -hmm. anonymously with a clicker mm -hmm. at the start of every long course every five week course we ask them is the security uh, situation in Asia Pacific getting worse getting better or staying the same mm -hmm. okay in every long course, the answer is getting worse, getting better, staying the same. This ratio varies largely due to whatever North Korea is doing. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of every five-week course, we ask the very same question mm -hmm. of the same people. Mm -hmm. At the end of every long course, the answer is getting better, getting worse, staying the same. The situation has not changed. What they've come to understand is they have far more shared interests than divergent interests. They've gotten a sense that they're more able to affect the situation. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's pretty powerful. I think it's because they got to know each other better um, and then their perspectives change. Yeah. I, I remember I wasn't ready to leave the program. <laughs> After one week, I didn't want to go. We didn't kick <laughs> you out. You just went back to work. <laughs> incredible. Now, what about for the workshops uh, internationally? Do you also have to decide, okay, uh, the composition of the mm -hmm. uh, attendees or the fellows? It depends on the purpose. Mm -hmm. So uh, w we do security sector development workshops often for a single country. Mm -hmm. And then the decision is just how many we want from the various organizations that are going to affect it. And how many U.S. Mm -hmm. and those are usually lecturers and facilitators, oh. mostly our team, some outsiders. Okay. But in a multilateral workshop, it'll depend on the function. We had the okay. workshop in Singapore in July of last year that was on maritime security in the Gulf of uh, Thailand. So the Gulf of Thailand nations were the ones that we invited, mm -hmm. and we looked for people, military ministry, the right ministries, and all that to get the right mix. And mm -hmm. I'd, I'd make sure our audience knows that. In our programs, especially the courses, the ratio is about 50% military, 50% civilian, mm, even though we're Department of Defense. We take a comprehensive look at security. Mm. Now, um, my last question before we come on the second break, um, how do you engage 10,000 alumni? Um, and I'm trying to learn from you because I am sure I can apply this to my work at the university. Facebook. <laughs> uh, Facebook. I mean, social mm -hmm. media helps. Mm -hmm. uh, personal relationships help. Mm -hmm. Every time I travel, 23 countries last year, and I think I'm up to 17 oh, this year, um, we hold an alumni event, and, and it's fabulous. I like to say that I'm one of the few people who can go home to some place he's never been, because when I go to some place where we have alumni, even if I've never been there, I have family, and we talk a lot about Ohana. We live Ohana at APCSS. Um, so we do that. We send newsletters. Every alumni got a notice that this interview is going to be on. I talked to one of them. I saw right. that. <laughs> so uh, we do that uh -huh. and uh, find every reason we can to just send a congratulatory letter for any accomplishment for any alumni. It's very hard work. Remember, we only have 120 or so permanent yes. full-time military and employees. Uh, only a few of them work in alumni. They chase this all down and, and work hard because we understand the value of maintaining that relationship. That's incredible. Um, General Leaf, we are coming on to our That's second quick. break. I know it is. 
you've got an excellent, excellent organization. I guess uh, in the third segment, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about what your vision is for the next two years, five years. Okay. That's great. My guest today is Lieutenant General Dan Leaf, Director of DKI APCSS. We'll be right back after the break. Aloha. This is Reg Baker, and I am the host of Business in Hawaii. We talk about positive stories, positive stories of businesses in Hawaii, how they have been successful, and how they have overcome some of the obstacles that a lot of us encounter when we try to have a business here. And believe it or not, there are a number of positive stories here, and we want to talk to all of you. So we broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, and it rebroadcasts again on Olelo Channel 54. So I sure hope to see you next time. Please tune in on Thursdays at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Hello, ha, how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech. Wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. If you are just joining us, my guest today is Lieutenant General Dan Leaf, Director of Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. Um, General Leaf, we, um, have a we had a lot of questions, uh, well, I have a lot of questions about alumni, and we can go on and on, and I guess other times I will, I will continue that conversation. But DKI APCS, your center is, it's incredible. I mean, it's a world-class education institution. Um, and I know be, we, when we were preparing for the interview, you kind of commented that it could be challenging to grow an excellent mm -hmm. organization. So share your thoughts with us on that. Well, it is an excellent uh, institution. It's been an excellent institution for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I came in as the director, that's a bigger challenge perhaps than going into an organization that's kind of in the basement that you have to bring up. How do you keep a passion to grow? And I, I think uh, it, the passion was already there for the mission. If anything I, I've done has been important, it's to be the storyteller about the effect, because I am a fighter pilot, I have to be a storyteller. But, but also to be able to relate everybody's work to the mission because everybody matters. And that small a center, mm -hmm. doing the things we do, everybody plays a role. And, and I, I think that we've got a better sense of that in some measure because many of our own people attend our courses now. 61% of our, our staff are graduates, including me. Mm -hmm. I took a week off and did uh, mm -hmm. the Asia Pacific Orientation course mm -hmm. in September of last year. Mm -hmm. And then you have to look at what you're doing and where you're able to grow, where you can do more. Our alumni area is one that we put a lot of effort into, and I used to say we're pulling silver out of gold mine. We're doing really good work, but that's a gold mine. They have 10,000 alumni, <laughs> is that important? Uh -huh. And so we've, we've done some thinking, strategic thinking about mm. how to leverage that. Mm -hmm. The fellows projects, like the one on election security in Myanmar, mm -hmm. there are many more, those are the stories mm -hmm. you wanna hear. Um, we've just started putting more focused effort on follow-up and ensuring that we know what outcomes there are and that we yeah. encourage outcomes beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we pay attention to what's important to our bosses at Camp Smith and in the Pentagon, and right now maritime security is very important. And we have great experts in law of the sea and other maritime. So uh, you're going to see some continued growth in, I expect, in our, our center. Uh, and a, perhaps a new maritime security course because it's needed and we have the capability. The, uh, I think the important thing to do is, is to view our accomplishments properly and, and humbly. Mm -hmm. um, I can brag about the work. Uh, I'm, when I'm bragging today, it's about the work of others, not my work. Uh, I can brag about that all day long but where you have the ability, we, you have the responsibility. And we have a responsibility to deliver the full potential of APCSS. And I think our folks understand that. Um, 
Let me ask you this question then. You talk about storytelling, and that's important. Mm -hmm. So when you work with your boss and relate these stories to them, um, what are some of the reactions? Um, that's a good question. It's hard for me to tell you what somebody else's reaction are. Mm -hmm. But they, I think because the, my bosses have big jobs and they're busy, so it isn't as much the stories as the appreciation for the fact that we're focused on outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some compelling stories. We mm -hmm. had a, a, a young fellow from uh, Nepal, from Kathmandu UNDP, named Chandra Hada. She did a fellows project. The short version is she did it. It was to improve earthquake readiness in elementary schools in Nepal. Mm -hmm. She briefed her boss when she got back. It was approved but not funded. He reconsidered. It got funded. 142 elementary schools were being renovated, refurbished, and rebuilt nine months after she started the mm -hmm. course. All of them survived the spring wow. earthquakes. So um, it's, I, I think I, I would hope that my bosses are touched by that kind of story, mm -hmm. but really have a sense that we're focused on outcomes that support their right. priorities right. and their directives. Um, now, you talk about fellows' projects and what they do with it and the changes that it brought to the different uh, countries, but I know you also have a very personal interest um, in women, peace, and security. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share with the audience? Okay. Women, peace, and security was first captured officially in UN Security Council Resolution 1325. In 2000 or 2002. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. has a national action plan and, and made a, there was a presidential commitment in 2013. The basic idea behind it is the protection of women in conflict, the engagement of women in conflict resolution, peacemaking, and in all things in security, uh, in negotiations and all that. So there's a lot to it. We, uh, in about two months after I got here, we got our first group in under that first and only group sanctioned under the oh. Women, Peace, and Security. Mm -hmm. And it brought the population of our course from about 5 to 10 percent women to nearly 20. And I looked at that, and I spent three and a half years in business as a vice president at a major defense company. And I knew that the only reason we hired a diverse workforce was makes more money. Okay, it's more profitable, and there's a lot of evidence to mm -hmm. that. If that's true in business, why would it not be true in security? And so I just made an arbitrary decision to make that a, a priority. We've nearly doubled our recruitment of women. We've added That's instruction great. about inclusion into the course, and, and we're building clear and credible evidence to convince folks that, that is not a motion and it's not a morality mm -hmm. statement, the factual evidence of why you must have women engaged in humanitarian assistance mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. disaster response and peacekeeping, how roles they can play in negotiations, and. And it's not men worn insecurity, women, peace, and security. It's about enabling both genders to achieve their fullest potential uh, and through a, a, a diversity of thought, innovation, and, and problem solving. So we're really proud of what we've done there. I think we've uh, done as much as any organization I know of in the U.S. government, and, uh, and it's having an effect. And it Thank you for the reminder because I remember when we were taking the TSC course, I forgot her last her name, but it was um, she gave a presentation about women, women peace mm -hmm. and security, and um, I thought it was uh, you know it, it was different, but it was it was nice that. Uh, that type of issues got brought up. I'm not quite sure what the reaction at my table was, but um, at least it's out there for, mm -hmm. for them to, t to think about. It, and presenting it in a meaningful way to mm -hmm. security practitioners, um, I think, is a challenge. And I think we had a guest lecture for years, and I That's remember right. that. I remember that because she's the only one who ever described me accurately to myself. I, I said, I'm not an academic. I'm not an academic. She said, I know you're a, philosoph a philosopher. <laughs> I guess I am. Yeah, I think I'm more of a philosopher than anything else. But, um, but that's what we're trying to build. Mm -hmm. And if you had seen the lecture, that just as a matter of opportunity, mm -hmm. I gave to the last mm -hmm. significantly more structured and more practical about mm -hmm. what you can do. We, we now have goals for what we achieve by our, our inclusion instruction. Mm -hmm. I pr prefer 
inclusive security to women, peace and security, because it takes both genders. Yeah. Um, but, but we're continuing to grow. The reason I made it my top priority was because I know I'm in a unique position to influence that. Mm -hmm. And I then said, this will be an I my top priority as mm -hmm. long as I'm the director at the mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. And I said that because I know this is not something you snap your fingers and, and achieve. That mm -hmm. you, there's a lot of uh, stereotype breaking mm -hmm. and mind changing and, uh, and fact finding mm -hmm. and uh, that has to be done. So mm -hmm. as long as I'm here, that'll be it. Uh, well, I hope for a long time then. Yeah. Now, let's talk about your experience. Um, you mentioned that you had private um, private industry experience. Mm -hmm. So how does how has that contributed to your current position here as the director center? Of course, in addition yeah. to your um, military experience. That's, that's an interesting question. The military experience um, contributed by understanding the security mm -hmm. environment and mm -hmm. frankly by seeing war a couple times and knowing how much better and how much harder peace is. The business, I think, uh, has helped me recognize it. We kind of are a business. We're not a military unit, mm. and we've been um, we've been in a, a, a good, strong footing on the budget, largely because of business practices. For you taxpayers out there, and I know there are some, we're about the most efficient organization you will find in the U.S. Department of Defense. We work hard at that. The, the folks in our admissions, the business operations, work hard at squeezing every dollar out of your or every drop out of your taxpayer dollar so having a sense for that and I guess having a sense for marketing which I'm doing right now <laughs> um, but but marketing to our bosses mm -hmm. to, to yeah. make the case mm -hmm. that has led to our current status of which we're in a good place yeah and being a good storyteller helps too I'm sure I hope so <laughs> now um, really coming to an end of the show it's That's amazing sad. how fast it is but uh we entitled this interview hidden treasure i know that um there are a lot of people who mm -hmm. know about your center there are but then there are also a lot of people who don't know so for those who don't know um maybe tell us something that you want them to know about and perhaps something that people don't know much about your center mm -hmm. well I, i'd say that hidden treasure is right next to the Holly Cove parking ramp by the Fort Derussi Chapel and most of our viewers have probably walked by it and wondered two things. What do they do there and do they have public restrooms? Because that's what people always think. Or, um, now you know what we do and where we are and that that location, it's beautiful. That's part of what makes APCSS work. That, the Aloha spirit, everything about this place. So now you know the basic facts, where we are and what we do. Um, what you, what else you might know is that um, some very important people come through there. They may be important at the time, they may become important, mm -hmm. but they're not important in the center. They're just people who build human relationships and understandings between differences in rank, in race, in country, in views and perspectives, and we do that thanks to the Aloha spirit. And um, I have to thank you for that, for the opportunity to come to that course, because where else could I meet somebody, a general from Pakistan, a Navy admiral from India, police um, office chief, a uh, police chief from the Philippines, and I can go on and on. Yeah, it was just amazing. an amazing experience. So thank you, General Lee. My um, pleasure, Alice. It was so nice to be able to talk to you on my show. Thank you. Best of luck, and I look forward to more stories from you. You'll hear them. <laughs> you know that. Thank you, Alice, and I really appreciate you having me on the show. Thank, thank you. you, and my alumnus. You planet. pass. <laughs> thank you. My guest today is Lieutenant General Dan Leaf, Director of Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. You've been watching Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Do join us next week.